I'm a UX writer on Figma's growth team. Off the bat, I gotta say, I'm totally floored by how tall all of you design people are in real life. And much like all of you, I'm a total Figma fangirl. Uh, besides riffing and writing in Figma, I've always used it for a very special and nerdy way, which is when my work day ends, I close Figma, I reopen it, and I make very effortful and deeply specific print zines about everything from BART to 1970s basketball speculative fan fiction. Make some very Gen X -y or geriatric millennial noise like woo if you know what a zine is. <laughs> hey! So if you haven't seen one, zines are physical, super retro personal magazines. Typically, they're designed and stapled by hand, but Figma made it possible for me, someone without any sort of design background, to scale up my old school 90s hobby in a very intense and modern collaborative way. So as a config host and Figma employee, I hereby encourage all of you to throw caution to the wind and make weirdo personal art on your business Figma account. Yeah, do it. What's the worst that could happen? Uh, we have zine making and book making and art tools in our free community templates, just saying. And if any of you see me afterwards, um, I have my card. I would love to connect with any of you to help you learn how to make zines and books on Figma. I have some copies of my zines to give out, so just say hi. Uh, speaking of connecting with others, some logistics. If you're here in person and need help finding your way around, look for a friendly face wearing a blue config shirt like them. They're Figma employees, and they're here to help you and show you around. If you're joining virtually, Figmates are here in the chat. So say hello and reach out if you need anything. Also, if you're joining remotely, take a moment, make sure you're comfy, your pet is close by or in your lap, especially if that pet is a giant dog. And for everyone watching everywhere, a reminder that you're definitely encouraged to share on social. So use hashtag config2023 on Instagram, Twitter, whatever your walled garden of the internet is. So let's get started with our first double feature about accessibility center design. First up is Katerina Porshnieva, an independent engineer from Estonia. She'll share strategies and practical tips on how to make better, more inclusive web forms. It's a great talk for front-end developers and pretty much anyone who partners on user flows. Please welcome Katerina Porshnieva. Oh, wow. Hello, everybody. I'm Katerina. I'm coming from Estonia here to you today. And accessibility is a big passion of mine that I'm really excited to share with you today. Accessibility as a part of inclusive design is all about ensuring equal access for people with disabilities. And you're likely are familiar with accessibility features in the public spaces, such as curb cuts, ramps, elevators, and sliding doors. But similarly to how curbs can be challenging for somebody using a wheelchair, some of the features in our digital products can create barriers for somebody using a screen reader, voice control, switch device, or braille keyboard. And one of the most common aspects of our application that can create such barriers are different types of forms. Be it creating an account or logging in, buying and paying for things, searching, sending messages, and more, often the only thing standing between the user and their goal is some kind of form, which is exactly what I want to focus on today. And this talk will be a practical guide on how we as developers and designers can make forms in our products more accessible. Throughout this talk, I will be using this sign-up form as an example, and I walk you through implementing various accessibility features in it. We've got a lot, quite a lot to cover, so let's start. And I want to start by addressing a couple of low hanging fruit first. And color contrast is probably one of the most talked about accessibility concerns. Yet, it still remains on top of the list according to the latest web accessibility research. And it's so easy to address. We have very explicit web content accessibility guidelines when it comes to color contrast and dozens of Figma plugins that can help you identify where the contrast is lacking. And while the text contrast is very commonly addressed, UI contrast, such as the boundaries of interactive elements against background, is often overlooked. 
So we can detect where the contrast is lacking and fix it by updating our color palette. It's already looking a lot more legible. It will already not only help users with visual impairments, but also anybody using your product in a brightly lit room with a on low resolution screen or with an eye strain. Next, another easy fix, and it's focus indication. Browsers provide this default focus outline to identify which element is operable right now via keyboard. However, often when these don't match the design aesthetics, they're either completely removed or replaced with something that is barely distinguishable, which makes experience for keyboard users really confusing. Imagine uh, trying to operate the computer with a mouse without seeing the cursor on the screen. So instead of removing them, we can create custom, beautiful, and legible focus outlines that match our design language. Yeah, I made it pink to give it something a little extra. Uh, but what's more, we can also use the new, but already well-supported across modern browsers, pseudo class called Focus Visible. What it does, it makes sure that the focus indication is only displayed when navigated via a keyboard and not the mouse which kind of lets you achieve best of both worlds, maintaining design aesthetics for all of the mouse users while keeping it very functional and legible for anybody using the keyboard. Now, to dive into meteor subjects of web form accessibility, we need to talk about semantics and understand how assistive technology works on the web. So let's do a small detour to talk about it. On the web, everything starts with HTML, right? It describes the page structure and its contents. But by itself, HTML is just a long piece of text. It wouldn't do anything. In order to display the UI, browser needs to parse it, and it builds the DOM tree in the process. And then out of the DOM tree, it builds the visual UI that you can see and interact with within the browser. But it doesn't stop there. In the parallel to that process, it also builds an accessibility tree, containing all important accessibility information about elements on the page which then gets exposed to assistive technology, such as a screen reader or braille keyboard. But it's a lot easier to understand with an example. For this HTML page, accessibility tree will look something like this. Note that only elements that provide meaningful semantic information are included, and everything else, such as this div that we use for styling, is completely omitted from the accessibility tree. And each element within the accessibility tree has a role which kind of describes its purpose, what kind of element it is, and also an accessible name, which identifies it. In case of this button, it is inferred from its contents. Additionally, it can also contain a lot of other attributes to describe it further or communicate its current state. Then this whole tree gets exposed to assistive technology via the browser with a special API, and then is used to navigate the page. Let's see, or rather hear, what it looks like. Oh, we are not hearing anything. Can you turn the audio on, please? And maybe back one slide. Sorry. OK, can I try now? No audio again. I'm sorry. No, still no, still nothing. Oh. <laughs> okay, okay, they're reloading. I have quite a lot of audio, so we better get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, still nothing. If uh, if we can't get it, then I will just uh, you know play the screen reader for you. I can I can do that, but it would be nice to get the actual thing. Okay. Okay. It's a page web content. <laughs> Heading level one, hello config. It's, it's what the screener would say if it, it was working. Logo of config, image, 
main. Let's learn about web accessibility. Start button. <laughs> Yay! Uh, as you can see, or rather here, the screener takes and announces information, me as a screener right now, uh, straight from the accessibility tree. And in this example, we navigated the page sequentially. But in reality, a lot of the screener users, uh, users use a lot of shortcuts to navigate the page by headings, interactive elements, different landmarks, links, and so on. And this is exactly why using semantic HTML elements is so important. Because while we could make a button out of anything in HTML visually with some additional CSS, when the screener would reach it, it wouldn't have any information about this element to communicate to somebody who cannot see all of those visual cues. But when we are using semantic elements, we can convey meaning be behind our code, and therefore making it a lot more accessible. And there are more than 100 different HTML elements that all come with a lot of built-in semantics, different roles, states, and other attributes. And by using them, we can make our code more meaningful and accessible. Now, as we understood how assistive technology works on the web, let's talk about labeling. Because imagine filling a form like this. It seems confusing, right? Unfortunately, this is the experience for a lot of people using assistive technology. Because as of this year, more than a third of web pages don't have properly labeled inputs. So let's, so let's talk about what it takes to label the inputs properly. In our sign-up form from before, we were using placeholders to describe inputs. It's this little gray text within the input itself. While it is a very common practice, it has several serious accessibility and usability concerns. First of all, it's usually a lighter shade of gray, so it's a lot less legible but also it disappears as soon as you start typing. So it might be hard for people with cognitive disabilities or ADHD to keep track of inputs in longer forms. But it also has a low support in assistive technology, so it's likely to be completely ignored by screen readers. So instead, we should opt for a clear, visible label near the input. And the research shows that the labels positioned on top of the input are best for the readability perspective. OK, we got some music. <laughs> Uh, let's look how we can implement it in HTML. So the, there is already a semantic label element that we can use, and when positioned near the input, it will already visually convey information. But if we listen to the screen reader, and hopefully we can, we can hear it now. No, we don't. Uh, edit text, it, will, it doesn't pick it up. It will just say edit text blank. To understand why, let's look into the accessibility tree. Screen reader uses an uh, accessible name to announce elements on the screen. And our input right now lacks one. That's because the screen reader doesn't recognize that this label belongs to this input. To fix this, we need to explicitly connect the label element and the input element with foreign ID attributes. Now, the contents of the label can be used as an accessible name for the input. And it will get announced properly, like this. Username, edit text. Perfect. Uh, so uh, we can also bind them implicitly. Right now we use the explicit binding with foreign ID attributes, but we can wrap label element around the input. But this method is generally less supported by different versions of assistive technology, so it's still better to add foreign ID attributes just to be sure. Now with labels, our form is already looking a lot more accessible. And we generally want to keep labels clear and concise because they get spoken to and we don't want that speech to be too long. But also users of voice control need to speak out labels in order to activate different controls. But sometimes you want to communicate more information about the form itself or about inputs, which brings us to uh, providing hints and instructions within, within the form. So let's talk how we can do that. For general form instructions uh, that are typically positioned on top of the form, it's better to keep them outside of the form element. Because many screen readers have what is known as form mode, meaning that when they encounter and enter a form, they switch their navigation strategy to prioritize interactive elements, and therefore everything else can be omitted. So the text that is positioned just within the form can be completely missed by the screen reader user. Now, additionally to general form level instructions, we might want to pro provide additional hints or instructions to specific fields too, clarifying the expected format uh, and maybe giving us some additional expectations to, to the user. To implement it, we can place the text underneath the input, uh, and, but due to the form mode that we discussed before, this text still might be overlooked by the screen readers. 
Remember when we talked about the accessibility tree? I mentioned that all elements within the accessibility tree can have a role and an accessible name. But there is something that I didn't mention. They can also get an accessible description, which will be empty for, in most cases, by default. To understand how to set the description, we need to talk about ARIA first. Yeah, it's empty there. I also, the fonts are a little bit wonky. Um, yeah. Okay, ARIA. Okay, I lost all of my fonts. <laughs> okay. Um, ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. Uh, there's something, something really wrong happening here. Okay. Um, which, when we talked about semantic HTML, we talked that all semantic HTML elements come with built-in semantics, right? That we have, they have roles and names, everything that comes, uh, comes there. But often for the needs of modern interfaces, we need more flexibility. And that's exactly what ARIA is for. It is a web standard that defines a lot of additional roles that we can use in our, to complement native HTML with. We can set additional roles, roles, <laughs> states, and other properties uh, to create more interactive experiences. Uh, for example, we can set a role of a button to the div. and it will get updated in the accessibility tree, but it won't make an actual button out of this div. In order to do that, we would need to implement a lot of custom JavaScript and CSS to actually implement the expected behavior. Generally, we can treat ARIA as kind of like a promise. We are promising a user that this is something that is expected to be a button, and it should behave as such, and therefore it is on us as developers to implement that logic to make sure that that expectation is met. Um, can we go back a slide, please? Uh, and it's very, very useful for a lot of interactive elements so that are not natively supported by HTML, like different widgets like tooltips, switches, combo boxes, tabs. Oh, phones are back. Nice. Uh, that we can use. Additionally to roles, ARIA provides a lot of other uh, attributes that we can use to add uh, additional properties and states that we can set, all pre uh, prefix with area dash something. And here are some common examples. We can use area label to set an accessible name for an icon button that doesn't have one by default. That then will, the area label contents will be used as an accessible name. Additionally, we can use area labeled by to use a different element as a source of an accessible name for our element. Like here, we are using a search button as a label for the search input. That is then will be used in the accessibility tree and therefore properly announced to the screener users. For the sake of an accessible description, we can use area described by. And we can connect it to our input by setting an ID to the span containing description and linking to the input itself. And uh, then it will get update the accessible description within the accessibility tree, and typically it is announced after a pause. Username, edit text, Username, must edit be text. between 3 and 20 characters long. <laughs> awesome, awesome, we got our audio back. <laughs> and that is how we can add accessible, um, different hints and instructions to the fields as an accessible description. Uh, but also often, especially in longer forms, we have a combination of required and optional fields. So let's talk about how we can implement them accessibly. They help to guide users through the form completion and decrease the chance of mistakes. In our form, for example, we have three required and two optional fields. Uh, the most common way to mark required fields is to use the red asterisk symbol near the label. Let's see how we can implement it accessibly. If we just add the asterisk symbol to the label, it will actually get pronounced by the screen reader like this. Username star, edit username text. Star, edit text. Which can be confusing. And it's actually the case with a lot of elements that you might use for decorations, such as different icons and separators. To avoid that, we need to hide it somehow from the assistive technology. And we can use another area attribute for that. It's called area hidden. If set to true, the element within that attribute will be hidden from the assistive technology. And it's very useful for different decorative elements you might have uh, within the UI. Now we have the visual cue with the asterisk symbol, but we still need to tell the assistive technology users that this field is required. One way to do that would be to use native HTML required attribute. But together with the semantic cue, it will also introduce the additional 
HTML validation. And you're probably familiar with this. It is uh, a little bit inconsistent in different browsers, and it's also not flexible enough. So in most of the cases, for better user experience, you might want to implement your own validation from scratch. And we'll cover that in the next chapter. But right now, we need the semantic queue, but not the associated behavior. And this is exactly the use case for ARIA. We can add ARIA required attribute to communicate to the user that the field is required and skip the, uh, the default validation. And it will be communicated like this. Username, required edit text. Now we learned how to mark required fields. Uh, and while this is a very common approach, you, can, you might also consider marking optional fields instead. In this case, the form can be perceived as less threatening, but if you do, I would still recommend leaving the area required semantic attribute still on. Now, despite our best efforts of making clear and visible labels, providing instructions, and hints, marking required and optional fields, we can never eliminate human error. And how we validate the user input and display error messages can have tremendous impact on the user experience of the form. But before diving into the implementation of validation itself, let's uh, consider a few important aspects. To indicate between different statuses, we often use color in the interfaces. We use red for errors, green for success statuses, and so on. And while there is nothing wrong with that, we need to remember that different people perceive color differently. And to avoid the color trap, it's better to add other means of conveying the same information. And just by adding an icon, we can already make it a lot more universal. Additionally, when getting back to our form, if the user input is incorrect or missing some data, uh, I, one pattern that I often see is that the submit button is made disabled. And while it is a common approach, again, it, is, it can be disabled buttons are really confusing to the users because they prevent them from understanding what exactly is missing or wrong. And it's better to keep the button enabled and show error messages when the form is submitted. Now let's see how we can implement these error messages. To indicate that the um, kind of field has some invalid data, we are using the red border and an icon here. But similarly that we have this visual queue, we need to provide a semantic queue as well. And yes, you, you guessed it. There is another area attribute for that. We can uh, set area invalid to true. And in that case, it will be set in the accessibility tree and then announced by the screen reader. And another handy tip in here, you can actually use this area attributes to style different states of the components. And I really like this approach because, first of all, it's reliable and reduces the number of code uh, that they need to write. But it also makes sure that all of your visual cues and semantic cues are always in sync. Now, uh, we also need a way to display an error message. And to do that, we can use the same approach as we did with an accessible description. Area described by can actually uh, accept several IDs, and then it will concatenate them together when announcing the description. Username, required invalidate edit text. This username is taken. Awesome. We just learned how to display inline error messages and mark semantically fields as invalid. But especially in longer forms like ours, it's a good idea to display an error summary for the whole form. It can give a high level overview of all errors that uh, need to be addressed in the form. Um, but when a sighted user submits a form, they visually see changes on the screen that notify them that something is wrong. But if we consider experience for somebody who cannot see the screen, we need a different way of notifying them about those changes. Which brings us to live regions. It's another really powerful and important feature of ARIA that allows us to define certain places within the page as live. And then, no matter where the screen reader is positioned right now, as soon as something changes within that region, it will get notified. And therefore, can announce the change to the user without losing its current position. And we can set it with area live attribute, which supports several settings. It can be polite, meaning that it will finish whatever it was saying before announcing the change. Or it can be assertive, that it will interrupt the speech for the announcement. And it is very useful for different alerts and error messages, which is exactly what we need for our form. So we can use it to set the error message as area live attribute assertive. And then when the user submits the form and the message will appear, it will be triggered as a change and therefore announced to the user like this. Sign up button. Sign up failed. Username and email fields are invalid. And we can use the same approach for other types of messages as well. For example, when we are successfully submitting the form and we want to notify user about something, we can use the same approach. Sign up button. 
Account created. Check your email for confirmation. And that is validation. This was the last piece of the puzzle that I wanted to, to cover. But before finishing up, let's do a little bit of recap. We started with the form looking like this. First thing we did, we addressed the color contrast, which made it a lot more legible and helped not only people with visual impairments, but also anybody using it in a brightly lit room or with an eye strain. Then we made sure we have a clear and visible focus indication, which we implemented with focus visible pseudo class. Then utilizing semantic HTML, and we learned why semantics are so important, we made sure that inputs have clear labels, and those labels are associated with the inputs with foreign ID attributes. After that, we learned about ARIA, and we used ARIA described by to provide accessible descriptions for inputs in our forms. Then we learned how to semantically mark inputs as required with area required attributes, and how to hide some presentational elements with area hidden attributes. And after that, we learned about validation. We discussed the color trap and how to avoid it for better accessibility. We displayed input level error messages as an accessible description and learned about live regions and ways of to communicate to the users about important changes on the page. While we covered quite a lot of things, there's a lot more that I had to leave out because of time. And even though we have generally a lot of guidelines and best practices of making forums accessible, nothing really replaces a lived experience. So I really encourage you to involve users with disabilities into your testing process. You can learn a lot and make your experiences truly accessible. And generally, accessibility is not something that is black and white. And by making small changes, we can move towards more accessible product, but also on a bigger scale to a more accessible and inclusive web for everybody. I hope you learned something new about accessibility today. Uh, and got inspired to make it a bigger part of your design and development workflows. And thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katerina. That was nitty gritty. It was important. It was a great way to start the conference. Let's hear it for her again. Amazing. Next up, we have Vanessa Giotto and Emma Susi from Canal Plus Group. You know, the cultural giant movie production company that bought us both Free Willy and 2016's Carol. Uh, Vanessa and Emma are joining us from Paris with some Tunisian flair to talk about building inclusive product culture inside a traditional media company where people are streaming from all sorts of devices. And they'll explain how important it is to be human-centric when you're transforming organizations, cultures, and systems through their focus on visual disabilities. Expect to hear about design management, collaboration, and some very cute design. Uh, uh, expect to hear about design management, collaboration, and some very cute guide dogs. I, for one, am at the edge of my seat to hear what breed of guide dog is most common in France. Is it a basset hound? We will find out. But I'm also very excited to learn about the ins and outs of closed captioning, something that fascinates me nearly as much. Please welcome Vanessa and Naima. Hi, everyone. We are so happy to be here with you today to talk about product design, accessibility, and inclusivity in audiovisual media. I'm Vanessa. I'm head of product design at Canal Plus. Hi, I'm Naema. I'm product designer and accessibility specialist at Canal Plus. After this quick introduction, I'm sure some of you wondered, what is Canal Plus? And where is it from? We are from France, just like Canal Plus, which is a major French pay TV channel. By the way, breaking news, our national channel 4 will celebrate its 40th birthday next year. <laughs> But Canal Plus is not only a TV channel, it's also a content aggregator and a producer of movies, series, documentaries, and even sports content. When I joined Canal, um, but let's go back to the topic of the day, sorry. These last few years, accessibility and inclusivity have become key societal issues around the world. In the same time, in France, a non-accessible digital product can be considered as an act of discrimination. That's why, at Canal Plus, accessibility has been naturally identified as a pillar of our future corporate strategy. 
and mostly for my canal, our live and streaming video platform. My canal is a rich and also a complex technical product because it's available on many devices like TV, mobile, uh, desktop, and many more. And it's also available on many technologies like web, uh, Android, and uh, iOS. iOS. <laughs> And it's also available on many countries, 50 to be exactly. But with uh, all the French regulations and so many users and devices to address, how can we guarantee a MyCanal experience efficient and accessible in the same time? That's exactly the challenge we decided to take up with the Canal Plus product team. The story we would like to share with you today started in 2020 when I joined Canal Plus during the second lockdown in France. The perfect timing, I know. At that time, Canal Plus was a very French traditional media group, so with a strong artistic direction spirit and a mainly business-centric strategy. The product culture was still quite new because it existed for barely two years, and the design strategy of the MyCanal interface was not totally defined yet. So, as the new head of product design, I had two main goals to achieve. <laughs> the first one was to structure and manage the product design team. The second one was to build a product design strategy compliant with the global product vision, of course, but also with the Canal Plus text. To achieve this mission and to help the MyCanal product um, team to make the MyCanal experience efficient and accessible in the same time, I needed to think uh, design strategy inclusive in the first time. And because I always been convinced that thinking people first was the best thing to do in product, I decided to adopt a fully human-centric vision from the start. But what do I mean by human-centric vision? I'm convinced that man can live without a system, but a system cannot exist without man. It means in product, human is the key of everything rather than technology. So as a newcomer and as for any new project I start, I decided to starting by assessing the situation of product design in-house by collecting insight directly from the Canal Plus employees. I needed to understand how people and entities interacted with the MyCanal product, but I also needed to, to, find, to identify sorry, which kind of difficulty they encountered with the existing product process, for instance. So during a few months, I, inter I drove an internal research phase and I interviewed 20 people across the product design team, the product management department, several tech entities, and even the artistic direction. I collected a lot of rich and very useful insight to feed my reflection. But I also identified four major pain points I had to address absolutely right now. The first one was about the product design expertise, which was very UI-centric and not really user-centric. The second point was about my own team, the design team, because I quickly understood that my designers were very UI-oriented also and not very mature about the UX methodologies. The third point was about the product experience, so the MyCanal experience, which was too disparate from a device and a technology to another. And the last point was about the collaboration, which was limited and even sometimes a bit complicated between design and tech. So with all these key findings in mind, I now had all I needed to define the perfect design strategy. But it was impossible to find solutions to all these key problems in the same time. So I decided to prioritize my next move and to take action 
uh, through four different steps. First of all, the most important thing for me was to make my own team more mature about the UX methodologies. I also wanted to equip the designers with more adaptive tools to help them to adopt a fully user-centric approach in their design. So to do that, I trained my team with uh, the main UX methodologies, and I decided to integrate user research and user test into the new design process I just deployed. By that, I wanted to make the designers aware of how our end users really interacted with the MyCanal platform. My third uh, action was about tools. Because of the lockdown and the constraints of remote work, I decided to replace all the existing stack of tools by more efficient and inclusive ones, like Figma and FigJam. By that, I wanted, uh, to, I wanted to ensure that the designers could work from anywhere and from any devices, and that the designers could, could collaborate with other entities despite the distance. The next action, and the most complicated one, was about the design system. Indeed, I needed to improve the quality, the product quality uh, for both design and tech side, and to improve the user satisfaction by unifying the MyCanal experience across devices, technologies, and countries. Uh, my idea to do that was to just centralize all the design and technical components into a single repository tool. Easy peasy. But, as I said, I was new and the product culture was still limited, so before I was able to do that, I, need to, I needed to evangelize a lot uh, about design across the company. And I did that uh, to convince the key decision makers to trust me and to become my allies to achieve this very strategic but also very complex challenge. And finally, the last action, but not the least, was about people. Indeed, uh, I quickly understood that to activate all these actions, I couldn't do that alone, and that I needed people for that. So I decided to hire new profiles and to define new roles into my own team to do that. The first role I, de I defined was the design ops because I needed a design ops to help me to design new process for the team and to facilitate the collaboration between entities. The second role I defined was the UX writer. The UX writer was there to think an inclusive editorial strategy all across the MyCanal product. But as I said, I, I also hired new profiles. I started with technical profiles, UX engineers, to, in the first time, bridge the gap between design and tech, but also to guarantee the accessibility of all the technical components for the web, iOS, and Android. And finally, I hired a product designer with an accessibility specialty. Naima was here with me today. I hired Naima, of course, to work on the MyCanal product as any other designers, but also to guarantee the accessibility of all my canal design components. So now that my team was structured, that the design strategy was defined, that the challenging um, design system project was launched, uh, and that accessibility profiles joined the team, we were finally ready to make the my canal experience accessible. By definition, accessibility concerns disabled users and it's a part of inclusive design. So our product can be inclusive if our design is not accessible. In France, 20% of the population need accessible products. Two years ago, when I joined Canal Plus as a product designer, my mission was only to support the design team to redesign the My Canal shop. And because I had some UI accessibility skills from my previous job, I started reworking some my canal components with the right contrast colors and a good typography sizes. My goal at that moment was only 
to guarantee a better user experience and ideally to converse the conversion rate. But I could not approve the value of my work because I had no KPIs about disabled users. So maybe unlike you know, and uh, unlike traditional KPIs, it can be really hard to quantify the success metric of accessibility. And indeed, in France, to respect the, privacy, uh, the user's privacy, we can track the different disabilities in uh, different platforms. So we can't quantify the accessibility user's needs. At that moment, my challenge became, how can I help the product team to understand the importance of accessibility and how accessibility can be prioritized in the product roadmap? Then, with a product manager, we decided to create a squad dedicated to accessibility and we looked for our starting point. For a video platform like my canal, we thought it could be really impacting if we starting with the most challenging disability, the visual disability. Because if my canal can be accessible to blind users, maybe one day we can be able to say that you are accessible to everyone. It was not only a big challenge, it's also an opportunity to innovate our product. But what is innovation? Innovation is testing things without knowing where you are starting from or where it's going to lead. To identify the frustration and the satisfaction of blind users, we started by going back to the promise of my canal. My canal is a video platform where anyone can stream videos, like movies, sport documentaries, and on with different devices, like TV, mobile, uh, desktop, laptops, much more. But is this promise kept for blind users? To answer this question, with the product research team, we launched some user testers to understand how blind users uh, logged on my canal, how they find their content, and how they simply started their movies. So we spent two days with 10 blind users and a lot of cute uh, dogs in an OEG office, and it was to understand how this population consume media, uh, media contents on web and iOS platforms. The, to use their own devices, this population needs a screen reader to describe the elements and the journeys of uh, their devices. So we activated VoiceOver, the screen reader of Apple devices, and JAWS, one of the screen readers of Windows devices. I was so surprised about how easily blind users interact and use their, uh, pro uh, their uh, digital products. So if they can't use my canal, it's only because we are not totally accessible, not because they are not autonomous. The user test has helped us to identify so many findings. I would quickly to share with you three of them. First, we learned that our web experience was our weak point because, our, because the components labels was unnamed. Secondly, we discovered that neologisms are not always functional. In France, we love mixing different words from different languages, but when the screen reader pronounces the sentence, it means nothing, it means nothing, because the pronunciation is not always uh, comprehensible. And finally, we also learned that the MyCanal experience on iOS platform is really better than the web uh, platforms, and it's simply because the technical requirements for uh, accessibility for, Apple, uh, for iOS devices is uh, more strict. But now, how can we help the product team understand the importance of accessibility? We simply confronted them with blind users and shared the video's user testers. It was a real game changer. Then we created uh, an iterative process to integrate all the accessibility improvement without disturbing, the, without disturbing the product roadmap. The first step is uh, collect insights. We collected feedbacks and then we associated them to the right uh, product squad. 
Then, in each squad, we identify the right product profile to take care of each feedback. For example, we asked the design system team to integrate and design a rework of all the unnamed components to make our web experience more uh, accessible. The second step is collaborate on solutions. With workshops, we all together find solutions to integrate the accessibility improvements into different project sp uh, sprints. We also decided to test all our new feature on iOS devices uh, in priority because the MyCanal experience on iOS devices was well received by blind users. And finally, the validate iterations. Um, after any implementation of different improvements, we, use, uh, we launch a new user testers to, uh, to, um, to, uh, to validate or not our hypothesis. Thanks to the innovation opportunity, we understood what it really means to design for blind users. Now all the product team are aware of the importance of accessibility and everybody is convinced that we can have a positive impact if we all stay user-centric. In only two years, so much work has been accomplished by the Canal Plus product team. And to be honest with you, all the feedbacks we collected internally and externally about our actions were very positive. But if accessibility has become a pillar of our corporate strategy, it's impossible to think that the product team can do that alone. That's why our next step is to continue to evangelize a lot about design and product across the company and to convince as many people and entities as possible to join us in this amazing human adventure. Thank you so much to all the Figma team for this amazing event. We hope you found our experience helpful. Enjoy the other talks, and don't forget to make your product more accessible and inclusive. Thank you.